Okay, so if you came to the uh, first um, first night, you'll probably recognize the slide, but we're just gonna go over it again. Um, so like, if, does anyone need accommodations to participate fully? Um, if you need, just feel free to put in the chat or you can um, DM me or Jason. Um, so if, if um, <laughs> sorry. We also have closed, we have closed captioning available and you have the option to turn or turn it off. Um, it's in, it should be in like the bottom part of your screen, like with where the more is. And um, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is just set up. Um, just kind of a reminder, we will be recording the event. So if you feel uncomfortable with that, feel free to turn your video off. Just make sure to put your name and pronouns in your um name on the on the and on zoom so you know we know how to address you respectfully and the next slide is a land acknowledgement and i'm going to pass it off to ava hi i'm ava uh i work with yeah networks she her pronouns and tonight we would like to take some time to recognize whose land we are on today. We have youth from all over the nation this year as this event is virtual due to the pandemic. However, the Youth Climate Justice Summit is typically held in the state capital of so-called Minnesota. We recognize the First Nations of those whose ancestral land, ancestral and contemporary lands of the state, the Dakota, Ho-Chunk, and Anishinaabe. We acknowledge this because the effects of genocide and colonization shape the everyday experiences of indigenous individuals and communities who are alive, resilient, and leading change, especially for climate justice in our world. And then you can find your native land at uh, the website, which should find its way to the chat here. Um. Okay, there's the link to where you can find out about your native land. Um, also, I just realized I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. Um, my name's Indigo, I use they them pronouns and I'm a junior um, and I'm, yeah, I'm a junior that goes to Fair Downtown, which is a Minneapolis school. And so you guys can all feel free to put your name, pronouns and what lands are joining on us, joining us on from in the chat. Um, the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, who, who YAH is. So YAH stands for Youth Environmental Activists of Minnesota. Um, we're not, we're associated with the nonprofit organization Climate Generation, and we like to, we help empower youth to, um, in, <laughs> we help to empower youth make change for climate justice um, and support social activism. And we use a climate justice framework, which means that we understand that climate change will affect everyone differently and that um, it will, the effects of climate change will follow in the um, pattern of systemic oppression. And, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've been working on. Um, so if you've kind of been through the summit, you've probably already heard this, but Right now we're working on a bill for climate justice education and um, we are really trying to get that passed and get a hearing. And I'm gonna invite Ava back to share more about what that bill's gonna look like. Yeah, so our bill would require climate justice education to be included in all core subjects for, grade, for grades one to 12. So that sort of would be like in science class you would learn about how like the ice caps are melting and how that affects wildlife. In history, you might learn about the history of imperialism and how that relates to climate change and the history of climate change in general and what caused it and why. So this is really important because it would encourage schools to teach students about systemic oppression in relation to climate change and create a better community understanding of racism and climate change. So our future leaders will be better equipped at creating just solutions to climate change. Our current goal is for the bill to get a hearing in the Minnesota House and Senate. And to do this, we need a lot of people to push the representatives, uh, particularly Senator Chamberlain for a hearing. Thanks for that, Ava. Now um, I'm gonna welcome Chris Heater 
to the stage to um, share with us a poem about uh, the importance of storytelling. Hey, everybody. My name is Chris, and I have a poem, and I have a quick story for you. Um, and that is because what you're doing tonight is so cool. And for some of you, it's already like, oh yeah, we do this as part of what we need to do. Uh, for others, this might be your first time. And so I wanna remind you of the power of storytelling and then I'll read you a poem and send you on your way. So I could tell you, you know, it's always worth it to care. Maybe especially when things feel hopeful or hopeless, it's just always worth it to care. And I can see you're like, yeah, okay. Or I can tell you a story about how and why it's always worth it to care. This is Dewey. See, I'm a dog sled musher. I get to do that for a living. I uh, am a professional speaker and I guide wilderness trips. So I take people dog sledding, I take people canoeing, things like that. And I had a team of 16 sled dogs with my partner for many, many years. And we did our own breedings. And then we did a breeding of our two best lead dogs and we got a batch of four puppies, Dewey among them. Now, well, his siblings were getting bigger and they, you know, if you've seen puppies, the cutest things ever, right? They like nurse and they get all big and roly poly, they go play and they fall asleep, they come back, they nurse some more and they just start getting big really fast, which was happening for the three puppies, but not for Dewey. And by week five, we knew we had a problem because he was skin and bones and the other three puppies were really plump and filling out. So we went to the vet and our vet looked him over. He said, I can't really tell you what's wrong with Dewey, but I can tell you that if you have a five week old pup who really can't hold down any food, most people would put him to sleep. But I know you guys, so here's the name of the vet I would recommend at the University of Minnesota Vet Hospital, have fun spending all your money, which we probably did. So we took him there and um, what they found was he had a part of his esophagus that had no motility. So the milk or food would get part way down and then just the littlest bit was getting through, the rest was coming back up. It was not survivable. And they said, we could try an experiment. We could try surgery where you essentially slice it this way, sew it this way, maybe we can jump that part and maybe he'd be able to take in food. And it was Dewey. So we said, yes. So it became far more complicated than anyone imagined. At eight weeks of age, Dewey had seven hours of surgery. Nothing any of us anticipated, but you know, it's Dewey, so we're gonna do it. So one day in the hospital, then we bring home this fragile little puppy with the words, don't let him take anything by mouth. Because see, if this was going to work, he had a feeding tube right into his tummy. And three times, six times a day for three months, we we're supposed to squirt food right into his belly, which is why he's wearing a jacket. We don't usually dress our puppies up. But he needed to have that feeding tube covered up. Now, huskies, we have Alaskan huskies, right? They live outside year round. They pull sleds. But now we've got this little baby who's a house husky. And we started getting used to having him there, right? So he's curled up in the laundry basket. Well, he survived to the time in which we could remove the feeding tube and then he was able to eat by eating this kind of liquid mush and we built a little tower for him because you can see that way uh, gravity helps the food go down right and we're all thinking oh this poor dog but it's a dog he doesn't think that way he's happy he's liking his food and he's doing okay so we kind of got used to have him in the house do you want to see him a year later Turns out that boy could pull, right? He's actually so strong and so fast, he pulls faster and harder than his three siblings. So we had to put a, um, we have to put him with our five-year-old superstar or he'd end up taking all the weight on the sled. He is still at risk any moment of aspirating where if he got hold of like a milk bone, he could choke on it and that could be it. He still has to eat liquid every single day. But this is a picture of Dewey after a run. And this is why I wanna tell you this story. See, it's always worth it to care. Maybe most especially when you do not have any sense of hope or that there is a positive outcome, it's just always worth it. The look on their faces, the person holding that dog and the dog himself, that is joy. That is what I would call wildness. It's always worth it to care, you guys. Because at the point at which we are saying we don't wanna get our hopes up, you have them. And if we're putting all our energy to pushing our hopes off to the side, we lose the chance to feel it. To quote the poet Mary Oliver, this is your one wild and precious life, right? So I say, why not step in it, right? For the beauty and the mess and everything about it, why not be in this life and dare to care? Instead of working so hard to kind of protect our hearts and hope we don't get hurt, how about just live in it, your true wild self? 
So I can tell you a story that tells you it's worth it to care and to dive in. And when you're getting ready to talk to the legislators tonight, you just step up in your brave, courageous, wild self and you do it and you do it with a story because you'll remember it. Now, I remember Dewey, where you might know, oh, yeah, it's worth it to care. Oh, you're like, you remember it because of story. All right, the requested poem. This is called Taking It In. And I wrote it back in October. If you remember, we had really early snow this year. And so there was a lot of leaves still on, on changing colors, but up on the trees. And then we had snow. So this is called Taking It In. Early snow. So many leaves still in the midst of autumn, from radiant yellows to deep red, russet, and orange. Really, the leaves were just getting started. Then big wet flakes drifted down all day long until seven inches blanketed the ground. Now brightly colored leaves sit atop the snow while most of their companions are still aloft, waiting for their time to release and make their way to ground. It's striking and beautiful, even as it feels somehow off. Something deep inside says, this doesn't look quite right, as if right were a word we could assign to wildness anyway. And yet, many things aren't right with our natural world, as our warming planet thrashes and changes faster than species and habitat can adapt. I feel as torn as those leaves sitting atop the snow, concerned to my core for this planet we call home, and captivated by the heart-stopping beauty of those very same leaves. We live in too much paradox, more than human hearts are designed to hold. The sense of foreboding and uncertainty sit alongside the beauty and enchantment we feel when we consider how intricately connected we are to this wild world. What's left for our big brains and heavy hearts to do but dare to let ourselves feel it all? to let ourselves love with abandon the natural world that surrounds us, whether that's a determined weed in the crack of a sidewalk or a mountain range with deep blue sky. And I mean really love it. Take it in until our knees buckle with awe and appreciation and compassion. It is from this place that we will play our part in healing the brokenness of our little world spinning blue. This is not merely an intellectual exercise. To make the changes necessary, it takes a wholehearted desire to right what has gone awry. We won't hold to changes and new ways of being if they come strictly from a place of shoulds and shame. Healing our planet takes courage. It means unlocking our hearts and taking in this world until we are crazy with love for this place that teems with life. Until our choices aren't even choices, rather a direction that we crave, unable to imagine any other way, no matter the sacrifice. Call out the poets, the scientists, the political leaders. Call out the children, the city dwellers, the inventors and entrepreneurs. There are so many more of us than you think. I mean, really, who do you know who wants to live on a world that is struggling to support life, where clean water grows scarce and extinction is an achingly regular occurrence, where habitats and open space disappear under the weight of us? I truly believe most of us want to live in harmony with the planet. What we need are bold ideas, wisdom, and direction. And right now, it's go time. It's all hands, hearts, and minds on deck. We will get there. We will get where we need to go when we shift the balance, when we free our minds and open our hearts that we tried so hard to protect from waves of despair. Bringing our myriad talents together, we can dare to imagine and think differently. When we embrace this world we share without reservation, we will see a planet full of people at peace, rejoicing and being able to live finally in kinship with this wonderful, wild world. You guys, I love your feisty nature. I love your youth. I apologize for people who aren't supporting you in this. Oops. I feel like you're alone because you're not. Thank you for what you're doing right now. Thanks for putting it out there tonight and for the work that you do with climate generation in your own lives. Keep being feisty. Keep being ticked off. We need you. And I thank you so much for letting me be a part of this tonight. Thanks, you guys. Thank you for that wonderful poem, Chris. That was really beautiful. And that story was just so wonderful and ador and your puppy is just so cute. <laughs> um, so on the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about what we're gonna do next, which and the main event of tonight, which is we're gonna do listening sessions with legislators. So we have um, five legislators that will, that are going to attend and you're all going to get 
um, get get broken up into groups with them, and you're and there's going to be a yeah, um, there's going to be a yeah leader to facilitate a, a conversation between you and the legislator about what about your experience with climate justice and just your experience with what you think you know your problems are what you would like to see changed and um oh the next slide actually has all of the like information written out so everyone can you know read it along um but yeah so we also have like some example questions here of like what do you see as an issue in minnesota or what's something you want to see happen in your future in your community there, there's going to be room for storytelling and there's going to be room for listening so hopefully that will be really great we're a little bit ahead of schedule so um we have nine minutes till i think some of the other legislators show up but does everyone maybe want to okay i guess we couldn't have everyone go around and say say how they've felt about the summit so far but if a couple people want to unmute and share how their experience has been or share in the chat that could be cool. <laughs> be a way to pass time I would say that it's given me a lot of hope. Um, I definitely felt like today, like way more hopeful afterwards. Um, just hearing different um, representatives or senators like say that they were so willing to, um, to like look at the bills you're we talking about or um, learn from us. So. Oh, that's wonderful. That's like the what we dream for this summit to be. I'm so glad that people are feeling optimistic because I feel like optimism is something we desperately all need in this time. It was really wonderful um, to finally have a seat at the table um, as an indigenous youth in the environmental movement um, and just in, in like climate justice in general. And I have learned an amazing amount just in the past few hours and I also have learned that I have more power than I thought I did in things like this to be able to talk to legislators and have them actually listen to me has been incredible. Thank you so much for like creating something so much, like so important and impactful for um, connecting youth to actually make change right now. Thank you for showing up. That's so powerful. I'm so glad we could serve as a conduit for you to, you know, have a seat at the table because it is a really powerful feeling and I'm glad you got to experience that. It's been a really good experience for me because there's been just so many people that you know, like believe in the same things as you and you can share ideas with them and learn from them in so many ways. It's really cool. Yeah, I love the community aspect of being a part of, yeah, it's so, it's been my opportunity to meet other youth, you know, who care about climate change. I think that's, community building is just so important. Did anyone have like a, a meeting or yeah, a meeting that like didn't go super well or that was kind of hard that you learned something from? Um, yeah, our group had a little bit of a hard meeting. Um, we met with somebody to talk about the climate justice education bill and um, they just kind of said they wouldn't support it and sort of just left the meeting because we weren't their constituents. Um, but yeah, it kind of gave us like some practice and like gave us time to think about how we'd approach it next time. And yeah.
Um, okay, we have like five more minutes, but uh, Chris actually has another poem she can share. So you can hear that before, you know, we go off to our breakout rooms. Okay, I gotta find it though, hang on a sec. <laughs> This one, to read it off my screen, but I trust you can still see me, right? I gotta make it big enough for these old eyes to look at. One more size up and I'll be ready to go for you. Okay, this one is called uh, For the Earth Warrior. And now my dog has chosen to chew on his squeaky toy, just on cue, take it as background music, here we go. It used to be that weather was the thing you talked about, at least in the Midwest, when there was nothing else to say. It followed hello and a mumbled how you doing with no expectation of a lengthy response. It quickly moved from there to temperatures, wind or rainfall, something you could really sink your teeth into. It had to do with altered outdoor plans or rain needed for crops and gardens. Here in the Northland, it was about wind chill and how the old timers used to walk to school in inclement weather without whining, that sort of thing. But these days, talk of weather has changed. What was once unusual has become the norm. Hurricanes, droughts, high and low temperatures are all off the charts we've faithfully kept all these years. Indeed, even habitats have changed. What once supported moose, for example, has shifted as temperatures climb, expanding the range of deer, bringing parasites and heat stress. You know this already, or are quickly catching on. What are we to do with what we know? At best, we feel a dull ache and concern, other times full on foreboding. Some of us channel this into action of some kind, at large or at home, we do what we can, we try to do more. It's frustrating and terrifying, but there is no temptation to look away. We feel this in our bones as beings on this planet. It is a deep inner knowing of something profoundly out of balance. If this were a pretty poem, it would wrap up now with something tidy and neat about how we will find our way. But this is a gritty poem that knows better. It joins the chorus of millions upon millions of voices, hearts, and souls that cry out and will not look away. So here it is, what I can offer is this. In your darkest places and times, when your love and actions on behalf of all things wild feel not nearly enough, remember you are not alone. There are countless like-minded wild souls here with you, also aware, also not willing to look away. You can take heart in that. We are a crafty lot. And when you need to sigh or cry or fall apart, there are others here to help you pick up the pieces and begin again and again until we tilt the circumstances or die trying. This beautiful world is worth it. And you earth warriors are part of that beauty. Wow, Chris, thank you so much. That was a wonderful poem and I think Perfect to uh, get us in the mood for that, for what we're going to do next. Um, I think we have two legislators that have aren't here yet, but I think we can just break out some breakout rooms and those with um, legislators can get to know their yeah, facilitator because I think the legislators should be joining soon. Oh, everyone's here now, great. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, we're gonna do breakout rooms now. Indigo, I use they, them pronouns. I go to fair downtown, but I'm, a, I do full-time PSEO and I really, um, and I really, yeah, I'm a part of yeah because I just really love learning about climate justice and um, applying to the framework to, you know, the effects of climate change. And I'll popcorn it to Nayana. Hi everyone, I'm Nayana. I use they, she pronouns. I'm a senior at Henry Sibley High School and I do full-time PSEO at the U of M. 
and I am currently doing a climate campaign through Yeah Climate, and I also started a group in my district called 197 Students for Change. Um, and I will popcorn. Oh, Nayana, I think you cut off when you said the person's name. Oh, I was going to popcorn to you, Na. Great. <laughs> Hi, my name is Na, and I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, my role in this work is as a youth leadership mentor with the Youth Environmental Activists Yeah Network. And so I'm here to support all of the youth here tonight and do what I can to empower them and uplift their voices. Um, thank you so much, uh, Representative Bolden, for meeting with us tonight. Um, I will go ahead and pass it to, is it Mariama? Um, it's Mariama, but I, um, I'm currently a junior at Rosemont High School. I'm doing part-time PSEO at University of Northwestern in St. Paul. And uh, my pronouns are she and her. And I um, am part of this club called We Share Solar, where we're currently building solar panels for this refugee camp in Uganda. So um, our club leader and um, science teacher um, told us to join if we were um, interested. And yeah, so that's why I'm here. And I can pass it down to Miranda. Uh, hi, my name is Miranda Kubek. I go to Mankato West High School where I'm a junior, but I'm also doing part-time PSEO at MSU. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I don't know if I said that earlier. Um, and I'm. this is kind of my first YEAH event, but I'm a leader with my school um, YES team where we mostly do advocacy for clean energy, although we also touch on climate justice topics and pretty much anything related to environmental justice. Representative Bolden, you can. Okay, good. Well, I will give an introduction as well. Um, I am Representative Liz Bolden. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I live in Rochester. I'm currently in St. Paul as I'm up here for work this week. Um, I am in my first term in the Minnesota House, so we are about five or six weeks into session. Um, my background outside of the legislature is in healthcare. I'm a nurse and work in um, education and leadership. So um, I lead a couple of teams of educators. My staff teach new staff in the hospital, mostly in critical care areas. Um, I also have a background around in uh, organizing um, with groups like Isaiah and Moms Demand Action. And that organizing work is really what led me to run for office. Um, it wasn't in my life plan to run for office. If you'd asked me a couple of years ago if I would be doing that, I would have laughed at you and said no. Um, but uh, here I am. And it really was my organizing work that sort of um, paved the way for that. Um, I'm also a mom. I have three kids. I have a daughter who uh, lives here, up here in the Twin Cities and then two teenage boys at home. And so it really is sort of a combination of uh, my mom hat in thinking about you know, the world that we are leaving behind for my kids and their generation, as well as my healthcare hat and thinking about just you know, the healthcare impacts and aspects of climate change is sort of what drives my you know, passion for this work or, or, you know, why I view it as important. Um, and I would just say that I, you all are so impressive. I just in listening in the last, uh, you know, 35 minutes that I have been here with you um, and just hearing your introductions, I, it just like fills my heart. I, I am so impressed with you and the work that you're doing. Um, and I just, I'm really looking forward to like the amazing things that you are going to do. And so I, I am really excited to be here with you tonight, and um, I'm happy to answer questions, but I am really interested in hearing from
Yeah. Uh, th thanks again for co um, coming. Um, so kind of a question to start us off is like, what does your ideal future look like um, or and feel like? And like, I can start, but I really want to hear from you guys. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, maybe I'll share and then hopefully another youth can, um, maybe we could stew on it while I'm talking. Um, I would say my ideal future just looks like a place where everyone can have access to um, clean, a clean environment and a healthy environment and everyone has access, you know, for um, a healthy lifestyle and like healthcare and just, you know, so everyone has, you know, I, I don't know what I'm saying, but like, yeah, access, just everyone has the same access to human rights. Um, hopefully someone has come up with something slightly more put together than that. Um, I would like to add on to that. Um, I can agree on like what you said by that, like having, I guess, a future that is clean and better and that's moving forward and I guess more progressive, I'd say. And then also like where, you know, people can like honestly just respect each other more instead of just shutting each other's ideas down, I think that would be a future that I want to be in. Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. And I guess this kind of falls in line with what you've both been saying, but definitely one where we're living in a much more sustainable way and a much more equitable way. So less destruction of the environment, um, just a better, like more equal social structure across the board in which there's a much less significant gap between people who have access to everything and then people on the other end of the spectrum who can barely like make enough to feed their families. I'd like to see that gap drastically reduced. It shouldn't exist. Um, I guess I would say future without capitalism, which is, you know, a big goal, but I guess a lot of the things that we're talking about related to climate and racial injustices, um, really all those problems root from capitalism. And that, yeah, that's my ideal future. <laughs> I'm loving all of like the radical thoughts coming out. Me um, too. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. Um, we can maybe go on to a next question or if Representative Bolden, you wanna share a little bit? Yeah, I'm happy to share. I mean, I would echo really everything that you all said as well, especially what especially um, uh, resonates with me is Miranda, your um, mention of just the narrowing of the gap between the haves and the have nots. And just, you know, in my view, I would love to live in a world where everybody has what they need to thrive, um, you know, which includes access to education and access to healthcare. And, um, you know, folks don't feel tied to a low paying job because it's the only way they have access to insurance. And, you know, that they, they are free to um, work on, you know, whatever their passion is, um, and there's, you know, opportunities, and, and there isn't such a, a you know, as you said, a, a huge gap between people who are, you know, have 10 yachts and 42 houses across the world, and people who literally can't feed their families. Um, so I, I, and one that's sustainable, where we, you know, all of us have clean air to breathe and clean water to drink and and that is sustainable um, in, a, in a way for the future. Yeah, talking about sustainability at clim climate generation kind of believes that everyone has a climate story. And so like, does anyone want to share maybe a time that they've been affected by um, environmental pollution or climate change and how that has shaped them?
I just wanted to mention I'm drinking a plastic, I'm drinking out of a plastic bottle, but I'm going to recycle it. Just saying, I felt kind of hypocritical. Okay, I just have to add that you should look at you should look into eco fascism because individual actions really don't matter. Um, but also, I understand what you're saying because I feel guilty sometimes. <laughs> but I I don't really have um, a specific example of um, a time that I was um, directly impacted by climate change, but I know that something that really got me passionate about this work was um, an example from 10th grade, my AP bio class, and my teacher was talking about climate change, but um, somehow added in that it still was a theory. <laughs> and I was like, ah, I can't believe that this is happening in my classroom. Um, and of course, I knew that that wasn't true, but um, it was scary to think that some of my classmates could maybe take that seriously. And um, yeah, here I am hoping that we can educate as many youth as possible. <laughs> yeah, I feel like yeah, I feel like I, everyone has like a story of like a teacher that's like been just really bad about climate change and stuff. Um, does anyone else have a similar experience? Or does anyone maybe have an experience of a teacher that's like taught climate change really well? Or they've been like inspired by? Can I ask a, a follow-up question just out of curiosity? Uh, because I'm limit, I'm feeling super old and it's it's been a long time since I've been uh, in high school at this point. It is climate change addressed in your science classes? Like is it I mean, so I, I hear your story about, you know, it was it was talked about as sort of a theory, but does anybody else have experiences of is it talked about at all or is it just not or I, what's the sort of the current state? Um, I would like to answer this one. Um, so sometimes it is addressed, but um, especially when it comes to like topics of biology, chemistry, physics, we don't really address climate change. Maybe when it comes to, like earth science and physical science, we'll address it. But um, for the most part, it's not really addressed. It's just what's in the curriculum. Um, yeah, I kind of agree with that. I have maybe one teacher who's ever really acknowledged climate change as an issue in a science class or really any classes. And that was less a part of the curriculum and more that that's something he's very passionate about. I think in general, there's this feeling like it's an issue that teachers are supposed to avoid because it's mm -hmm. too controversial, despite the fact that we know that it's happening and that there are facts that support it and it connects to all these issues we're learning about. I think sometimes, I also want to add on to what I said before, it's sometimes addressed more in um, government classes. When we're talking about like in political science or we're talking about in politics, um, but not as like, a topic in science and any science course. That's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I kind of like echo what everyone's saying. I've had like one science teacher who's kind of made a point to share it, but she was she definitely wasn't able to make it into like a big part of the lesson. It was like you know one small video, but yeah. Um, kind of maybe another question that ties into this is like, how do you wish you were um, taught climate change in school? Like, is there anything you would like to see? Oh, 
Go ahead, Miranda. No, you can, yeah. Okay, well, I was just gonna say, I, I mean, of course I wish we learned about it, period. But um, along with that, I think an intersectional lens is crucial to learn about any issue, specifically climate change, um, because leaving environmental racism and just the impacts that it has on women and non-binary people compared to men, like those are just all things that should be taught in the classroom and we really should stop to town um, different conversations that relate to race and gender and sexuality oppression. Um, yeah, I completely agree with that. I think in general, kind of like I was saying before, there's this attitude that like you have that administrators and that it passes down to teachers that certain topics, despite how important they are to our society, there's this sense that they have to be avoided because they're like too heavy to talk about. And I think in general, educational policy has to get to a point where it can recognize that we can't begin to make change on these issues until we get people comfortable talking about them. So I think, yeah, climate change education kind of has to be definitely in science classes, but also spread out into civics and other courses they're gonna talk about these social dimensions. Um, I also wanted to add on to that is that um, I think that, um, God, okay, so, <laughs> with uh, I would want to have like climate change and woven into science classes but not because that um because I needed to learn but because um a lot of people don't really take these issues seriously at all and um a lot of times when they hear something in school and they're learning about it they're kind of forced to they're, they're fo forced to open their eyes to the to like um, topics so that they wouldn't have learned before. And I think it would get a lot of people more invested in their future if they know that like it's at risk because of climate change and yeah. Yeah, I love that like people are pointing out like the importance of intersectional intersectionality and like the importance of, you know, teaching with a lens that focuses on more than just the like pure scientific aspects of climate change. Um, okay, another question that we can kind of maybe talk about is like, has there ever been a time that you felt like caught in a system or like you felt stuck somewhere and you didn't have like the um, access to, you know, the resources you needed and what was that like? And yeah. While you're thinking about that one, can I go back to the previous one for just a second? I, I think it's, I really appreciate, and I'm not sure who mentioned it, but whoever talked about, um, you know, having the conversations and not tiptoeing around the issues, I think that's so important. And, you know, we need to get to that place on many topics and many issues and, um, <clears throat> you know, climate change is one of them and sort of that inter intersectionality of, of, you know, structural racism and um, we need to have those conversations. And so I think, um, <clears throat> You know, in some ways we're, you know, that Minnesota nice, which is really, you know, Minnesota passive aggressive and we ignore the problem and then it festers and doesn't get better. And then because we don't have the conversation, we don't know how to have the conversation. And so I think if we could start have, if, you know, kids, even, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, if those conversations could happen in school in a, in a structured, positive way, um, I think that would could only be a good thing if, if then, you know, because then that leads to adults who know how to have conversations around tough issues. And, you know, lar largely we don't have that right now and it's a problem, so. Indigo, could you repeat the question? 
Yeah, the question I had asked was like, has there ever been a time that you felt caught in a system and you didn't have access to the resource you need? Oh yeah, and I just put it in the chat. Um, kind of like, you know, if it could be like, like um, maybe like, it could be as broad as like the patriarchy or something like that, or it could be more specific, like you didn't have access to, I don't know, like class, like advanced classes at your school or something. Um, for me, I don't know why this is the first thing I thought of, but this summer I was doing a lot of work with the houseless community in Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, specifically at Pine Park, if any of you are familiar. And um, there were several weeks where we were just kind of, I would go and help out and then people would be evicted and people's belongings would be stolen. And it was just, kind of confusing to me because at that point I was it's like why why wouldn't people want to help and I mean I guess I still am in this position but you know why wouldn't representatives and the mayor want to help these people um, who are struggling right now and now it's winter um, and things are even worse and I just felt very angry I guess and I wish that those resources were given to um, those people in a pandemic and also in a social uprising. Yeah, I feel like that's such important work. And it's, I think, I feel like we just love to ignore like like our houseless populations. And I think as someone who lives in Minneapolis, it's really important, you know, like to pr start providing more access and more resources because, you know, I, there's some quote somewhere like the, the like worth of, a, the justness of a society is determined by how, you know, we treat our, treat people in the with the least resources and I think it's really yeah and Ayana brought up a really good point um I don't know the first thing I kind of came up with was like being stuck in a binary or like thinking with just like gender and just like with I think ideas and like just thinking that there's always a right way and always a wrong way and um I think that's something that like I've had to unlearn or like with like learning about the like intersectionality of things like the intersectionality of like climate justice, you start realizing that everything's more interconnected than like separate issues that don't, you know, at all overlap. Um, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts though. Um. I think those were both like really good points. Um, I think another kind of experience, that the first thing I kind of thought of was in like different types of work I've done, but especially recently with um, sort of pertaining to climate justice, that there tends to be this kind of ingrained assumption that you can only make very small leaps, that you can only fix like one little part of an issue at a time. So I think getting to a point where school boards and governments and larger systems are more willing to make larger, more radical changes up front in order to address pressing issues rather than just putting things off and saying that they'll change them incrementally. Yeah, I totally agree, Miranda. I feel like we just need to get more comfortable with realizing that we're in these drastic times and that just, you know, those are drastic measures. Um, Mar, I'm sorry, um, Mayor Mar, do you wanna share? Um, it's Mariama, but um, I know it's a little hard to pronounce, 
Um, I don't know. I wanted to contribute. I just, I didn't know what to talk about. I don't, nothing really had come to mind about something that I, I guess I felt stuck. Um, you know, I'm not really sure. Yeah, that's cool too. Um, it's probably better like if you don't feel stuck. So, um, Representative Bolden, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, my um, initial thought with that is um, similar um, to what has been mentioned about sort of that incremental change and um, sort of our you know, our systems of decision making and legislation, um, you know, currently the way our legislative body is set up is that um, it just to be very honest right now in this session, there's not a whole lot of action happening in the Senate. The, the GOP controlled Senate is um, not taking action on really any issue. And so that is leaves me feeling a bit stuck when there's <clears throat> lots of work we need to be doing right now that is imperative. And um, I would just go back to um, Nayana, thank you for the work that you referenced that you were, were doing with our um, unhoused population. That's really commendable um, and much needed. And that is, you know, it's a failing of our society that we have people, um, you know, unhoused in a pandemic in the winter it's wrong. It shouldn't be that way. Um, and there are things we could do about it, but because of our, you know, system and the, the, the way things are right now, it is just very, very difficult to make those things happen. And so it's frustrating to me that we can't, and, and change is possible. And we, there are things that we can do and actions we can take. Um, I would like that to move faster than it is. <laughs> Yeah, that is a little bit frustrating to hear. And as someone who's been like working on the bill with, yeah, it does seem a little bit hopeless at times, but, um, oh, I, okay. And the next question we kind of have is like, what does solidarity mean to you? And what does it look like um, to show up in solidarity with others? For me, solidarity is just action instead of words. Um, I I don't know, especially in organizing spaces and interacting with adults, honestly, there's a lot of talk um, and not a lot of action. And so to truly be in solidarity, I think that action always follows the words and promises. I'll add um, solidarity for me. I, as a white woman, I think a lot about when is it time for me to use my voice and when is it time for me to be quiet and listen. Um, and I think there's a time for both of those. And I, I don't get it right every time, but I am working <laughs> to, to get it right more often. Um, and I think, um, in much of the work, whether it's climate justice or, or other issues, um, I think solidarity is often listening, listening to those who are closest to the issue and believing them and um, sometimes uh, taking the lead of other folks who are closest to the issue. And sometimes it's putting myself in the front of the, you know, putting myself in front um, to give cover for lack of better words, uh, lack of better words um, to those folks who are who are the closest to it. Um, to me, solidarity is unity, being able to work together for a common goal, um, like what we're doing right now. I think that could be a part of solidarity and like work we're all 
working together to um, combat um, and fight for change in climate change, social change. Like, um, I think it was um, a quote by Gandhi, I'm not sure. It was like, be the change you want to see in the world. And that's what we're doing right now. So that's what solidarity is to me. Yeah, I think I kind of agree with pretty much everything that's being said. I think also that idea of working of working with people and being able to, if not completely understand and like relate to what they're coming from, be able to listen to their experiences and understand when it's time for you to step back and let those people lead and when it's time for you to give your input. Yeah, this is, I, I love that we've had like several different um, ideas, but also like there's kind of a common thread in all of them. I think that's really cool. Um, another, maybe we could like circle back to it. I know I asked it at the beginning, but um, what does like, um, oh, sorry. Uh, I like, I'm like freezing up. Okay. Um, one question I have is like, what do you want to like take out of this summit and like what are, new like issues you want to fight for or old issues that you found or like action to fight for if that makes sense um what i want to take out of this summit is that my voice matters um i never thought that like you know being a high school student 17 years old thinking that i could like have a meeting with my representative and talk about what bothers me in school and what I want to see change, what bothers me in the world and what I want for my future. Because I've always kind of been in my inner shell. I never kind of, I never, I've never tried to reach out. And I think especially during the pandemic, I was kind of forced to be put in situations I was very uncomfortable with. And I think that um, um, this, I guess, this summit has, you know, helped me, you know, um, be able to voice my opinions more. And hopefully I can continue to do that. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think it has been kind of really helpful and kind of empowering to get the chance to have these meetings and to like hear from other people who are doing this activism at our age. Um, I guess also just in terms of things I've learned, I think I definitely learned a lot more about um, topics like environmental racism and how these issues disproportionately affect certain groups. And that's definitely going to be something that I continue to look into and to make part of my climate activism going forward. Um, I think today was, it was really exciting for me because I first got introduced to climate justice work through this event my freshman year. Um, and now I'm a senior and I was facilitating a workshop. And so not saying that I'm an expert by any means, I still have so much to learn, but I think it's really amazing that I am in a position where I can inspire people and kind of give people that boost to take action on the things that they're really passionate about and um, give them more information to, you know, just further the work that they are already doing or want to do. Um, and so I don't know. It was, it was really cool to lead a workshop and just have people ask me questions and actually want to learn about these things. Wow, I'm really glad that people have had such a positive experience. Um, I love that people are, yeah, like realizing that your voice is important, I think. Yeah, just like that's like the first step, I think, to like, you know, starting to 
um, be an activist is just realizing that like your voice matters and that you can share your voice and um, you know tell your stories to people who have power and that yeah um, maybe does everyone uh, this is kind of like a quicker question but like or maybe not but like what do people see as the biggest issue right now in Minnesota Um, it's definitely hard to pick one, but like I was saying earlier, probably houselessness. Um, it's terrifying that people are outside and the belongings are being stolen by the city. And I think that that's kind of like an urgent thing because people are dying in this weather. I'll chime in. I, I agree. It's hard to pick one because there are a lot of things happening right now. Um, I will take a little bit of a different spin. And I, I think I, perhaps the biggest issue is um, lack of empathy and disconnectedness. Um, you know, we don't all see each other as connected and equal and all deserving. And that means that we're okay with having people who are unsheltered in the pandemic in the winter. Um, and that means we're okay with folks not having access to healthcare. And we're okay with, um, you know, having unequal systems of education. Um, and so as a whole, I think, um, you know, the more we can see each other as all connected and all deserving, um, you know, the better off we'll be. Yeah, I think that's a really great sentiment and sums up like the underlying issue and a lot of, you know, the problems we're seeing. Uh, does anyone else want to share? Maybe just, maybe the biggest is the wrong word, but just an issue that you think that you see. Um, this may not be with climate, but um, um, issue I see is that um, the lack of acknowledgement of race, especially with schools, um, I feel like everyone is just, you know, um, avoiding the topic and it's never discussed, even when it's mentioned um, in history and English, um, they always somehow find a way to avoid having a discussion about it. And especially going to predominantly white schools in the suburbs, um, students are not always like, um, there's not that many African-American students or students of color. And when those topics are brought up, they kind of just look to you and see like mm -hmm. your opinion because they're unable to develop their own because we are never taught that in school. And I think that maybe being able to talk about like topics like race and maybe yeah, climate change in schools would have us um, be able to address the issue instead of avoiding it. Um, yeah, I think that all of the issues that have been brought up are all like really important. It is definitely really hard to pick one thing that's the biggest. Um, I think another issue that matters a lot to me and I think is really important right now is our handling of healthcare in general. 
both in terms of just the massive disparities we see in this state and this country in terms of quality of life and who's dying, including especially right now during the pandemic where that's becoming more and more apparent that it does very disproportionately impact people of color and like how unhoused populations got brought up and people who are living in poverty in general. And I think also just in terms of access to healthcare, we see these divides both in rural versus urban settings and once again, along the wealth gap. Yeah, I really emphasize what everyone has been saying, I think. Yeah, especially like the point about um, talking about race in school is like, it's really important. Like, um, I think teaching about racism as like the system and how it has, you know, impact it impacts the present, I feel like is really not talked about. I feel like in my history classes, race has been like largely ignored also. Um, also, Carrie Ann, hi, thanks for joining us. Oh, you're here now. Cool. Um. Yeah, hi, I'm Carrie Anna. You she, her pronouns. Um, yeah, so I was just part of another breakout group and it ended. So I got switched to this one. Well, we have like three minutes, but we were just kind of sharing like um, what are like what are big issues to us. Uh, do you want to share? Sure, yeah. Oh, so like big issues in Minnesota or yeah. in general? Or yeah. either or. Oh, I think like a really big issue right now in Minnesota is line three. Um, just because, well, I guess for multiple reasons, it keeps us, it's going to keep us dependent on fossil fuels. If the pipeline breaks, um, oil is going to spill into our watersheds. And then it's also breaking treaty rights. And there are so many indigenous people who are against line three, yet no one is really listening to them, which is very angering. Um, yeah, so I feel like that is pretty important in Minnesota right now. Yeah, Carrie Ann, thanks for sharing. I feel like line three is one of our Minnesota's most pressing issues right now. It's yeah, it's so it's gonna be so bad for the environment and so bad for the health of communities. And I feel like it really kind of bridges a lot of what we've been sharing already. Um I know, yeah, we're kind of close to ending, so maybe we could do like a semi-closing question of like how do maybe like just yeah, like how do people feel after this conversation? I'll go first. Um, I just am really grateful to um, have been able to be a part of this conversation. I will just echo again, I, you all are really impressive. Um, and I am so glad you are um, in this work. Um, I am feeling hopeful. Um, there is so much work to be done, but um, you know, it takes people like you um, to keep pushing to get that work done. So. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Know that your voices are matter and that your voices are powerful. And don't let folks tell you differently. They will tell you differently, but don't believe them because they're wrong. Um, so keep doing what you're doing and keep going. Um, and the other thing I would say is to find your people, find your your tribe and your your people who will support you and um, you know stick together and work together. Um, because you're gonna do big, big, bold things. So thank you for doing this and inviting me and this has been really good. Yeah, thanks again for coming and listening. Um, there's the breakout rooms. Does anyone else wanna share how they're feeling? Maybe like one word. I guess just excited for the future and for all of the advocates that will come out of this event. Optimistic for the future. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, kind of optimistic and helpful also. And um, thank you so much for sharing all your ideas and thank you Representative Bolden for being here.
Okay, and do you want to share? Yeah, I guess I'm just feeling energized um, just to be talking to a lot of people today. I think we should go around and introduce ourselves, name, pronouns, and what school you go to. I'm Carrie Ann. You can also feel free to introduce yourself in the chat too. And I see my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully you've all been able to hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, I've been having a really bad internet connection today. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Ann. I use she, her pronouns, and I am part of YAH. Uh, YAH stands for Youth Environmental Activists. And okay, I just want to double check. Can you still hear me? Okay, all right, great. Um, so, how many of you are on the YAH Slack? Cool. Okay. So, yeah, Slack is you is mostly where we do our work. Um, so I would definitely suggest um, joining that. And just to give you some info about what we do, if about weekly we have meetings where we just all come together and work on whatever we're working on. Like for example, right now we spent last month working on planning this youth climate justice summit and also talking to legislators about our bill the climate justice education bill so we have meetings every monday um i think they're like from seven to eight and they're open to everyone so all of you are welcome to join and what i really love about this group is it's super easy to get involved like when i joined i had no idea what i was doing um, but there's just like ways for me to get involved, small tasks to do. I had a lot of support from other youth and our mentors. And um, I've been having a lot of fun and yeah, so I think it would definitely, I definitely recommend coming to some of our meetings. I think our next one is next Monday and it is a welcome on, oh, 6.30 to 8 p.m. on Monday. Perfect, thanks, Na. Uh, we're going to have like a welcome, welcome, welcoming, uh, <laughs> welcome meeting on uh, next Monday. And um, let's see, I think we are also spending this time to talk about the climate justice education bill. So like I think Indigo was saying, we're trying to get Chamberlain to um, request a hearing for the bill. So I'm going to send a the bill to toolkit, which has a draft for sending an email to him. And if we could all take some time to just send him an email telling him to support the bill, that would be great. Also, does any questions about yeah or the bill? Okay, well, if you think of any later on, just let me know.
I do want to make sure uh, as someone who wants to support youth as much as possible and empower you all uh, to get active that we all stay connected somehow. And um, I think I saw most people's hands up when Carrie Ann asked if you all were on Slack. Um, I, I don't know, I don't want to single you out, Bennett. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't see or see in the chat, see a hand or uh, see you in the chat indicate that you're on Slack, but I did drop a link to connect with us on that platform if uh, you would like to do that. So uh, please join and you will continue to get updates on how you can uh, get active with us. And if you're not able to attend the Monday night meetings, um, there are still ways for you to get involved. Uh, and staying connected is, is one way to ensure that um, you get that information. So if you're not already on Slack, then please do join. I also wanna add that Na makes amazing weekly newsletters. So if you're ever wondering like, oh, what did yeah I do last Monday? You can just read the newsletter, all the information will be there. Um, the newsletters also include like uh, other action events that are happening throughout the week. And that's a great way to just stay up to date. Thank you for sharing that, Carrie Ann. I will definitely put more effort into them <laughs> than I have to make them even better, knowing that other people who uh, don't work with us closely right now will potentially be reading them. Um, so yeah, please do check them out. And um, like Carrie Ann said, there are ways for you to stay connected, even if you can't attend the Monday evening meetings that go from 6.30 to 8. And I'll just add, since we have two more minutes. Um, hi, I'm Sarah, I use she, her pronouns, and I also work with Climate Generation. So I support all the youth leaders who run the Yeah Network. Um, and there's also a Yeah Campaigns, which Maple is part of, um, which is a, a small cohort of students who are taking local climate action in addition to the statewide youth network. Um, and there's also a youth fund. So anyone can apply for a YEAH fund, which is given out every month. It's up to $500 for projects to help you take climate action in your own communities. Um, and that can include a really wide a range of different stuff that you wanna work on. So definitely check it out on our website, uh, yeahclimate.org. <laughs> Um, my name is Ava. I use she, her pronouns, and I go to Elberly High School. Just... What was everyone's favorite part of the day today? Oh, well, I really enjoyed meeting, sorry. I just really enjoyed the meeting with legislators. I'd never lobbied before, so it was just a really good experience. I enjoyed the workshops. Cool, yeah. It's always a neat experience to lobby.
And yeah, there were so many great workshops hosted today. It was really great meeting you all. I hope you all have a great night. Thank you for coming to the summit. Bye, see you all on the main channel.